It's the Neo, but is it the one? Well, actually, it's the Neo 6. My terrible pun from the top of this video already falling apart. Vivo has just announced the newest IQ. This is the IQ Neo 6. Full disclosures, just to get this out of the way, I'm currently working on a series of sponsored videos with Vivo talking about the X80 Pro. The IQ team also wanted me to take a look at this phone, so they sent it over for me to share my thoughts, my experiences using it. They've had no involvement on this video you're about to watch. The IQ label has been really exciting to track over this last year. Easily one of the best built phones of the year, the IQ 9 Pro occupies a very special place at the high end in the premium tier of smartphones. But we also got to see how a phone like this can occupy a more mid-ranger, daily driver, something a bit more accessible. Right now, these phones in a tier, which is just brutally competitive. Internationally, the remarkable options that we can find, sub 500-ish dollars United States, I really wish we got more of these here in North America. But that's enough introduction rambling. We want to get a bit more hands-on, so just follow me over here to the side. Okay, time for a little hands-on action. This is the Neo 6, and it's a really really pretty phone. The reflectiveness of this back camera housing does seem to be throwing my lens autofocus for a loop, so apologies if this floats a little bit more than usual. But before we really dig into the phone, one of the best selling points that we can talk about with mid-ranger and lower cost phones is the unboxing experience. I don't like to shoot unboxings, you know, traditional like, whoa, I just got this thing and I'm so excited. But I do like seeing this IQ label, just how fun the box is. And when you open the box, there's actually stuff inside the box. We can get rid of like the papers. We do get a case. So there's just like a clear plastic rubbery case. It's not bad for a little bumper, but this bad boy, I think a lot of people are going to be excited about. I haven't even taken the wrapper off of this just because I have so many Vivo chargers at the moment. This little brick is kind of a big deal because it's an 80 watt flash charger, which came in the box. Of course, because of different international voltages and whatnot, um, I'm not sure if my numbers are completely accurate for what the full output of this charger can deliver. Vivo estimates about a 50% charge in around 12 minutes. My experiences were just a touch slower, but I was using the flash charge through an international adapter plugged into one of my power strips, and it got me really close. A case and a fast charger in the box, but one other thing that I think is kind of fun underneath this USB cable, we also get a little headphone dongle. It's so simple. A lot of folks are going to act like something like this is disposable or e-waste, but if you already have a decent pair of headphones and you don't want to have to buy another dongle or accessory, it makes a mid-ranger phone so much more usable right out of the box. And honestly, if I had to pick, I'd much rather have the dongle than a dedicated pair of USB-C earbuds, because then I can just connect whatever inexpensive IEMs that I like to use. That's going to work a lot better. All right, let's get this all packed back up, though, because we've got a lot to say about the phone. Just scooch that box out of the way. I'm going to leave the case off just so we can look at how pretty this is. Design language is very familiar if we've been looking at recent Vivos. I love it in their upper mid-range like on the X70 Pro, how we get these iridescent sheen. It's really colorful. You can move it around. It plays with light in a very satisfying way. And it kind of reinforces why you'd probably want to stick with a clear case if you have a phone like this. But even though we've been changing on recent Vivos, we've been using more of this uh, full width camera sensor, and it's definitely blockier on the Neo 6, you can still kind of see the visual evolution from the X70 Pro to the, to the Neo 6. It's not just a big camera domino. We've got this extra paneling that kind of helps detail what's going on on the back of the phone. They've just spread it out and added the name of the phone here on the Neo. If you had to twist my arm, I'd say I like the full width a little bit better just because it reduces some of the table wobble, but this isn't too bad. It's a little on the chunky side and it does bounce a bit but you've also got to be a bit more deliberate on the corner to get it to waka waka waka. Pretty straightforward build, the USB-C, the bottom firing speaker. This is a dual SIM model. If we pop out that SIM tray, there are two spots for SIM cards. There's a nicely curved taper to the back. The front is mostly flat. The bezel surrounding the screen kind of has a little of that 2.5D feel 
where it kind of tapers into the edges of the phone, but it's not a curved display. So for folks who are a little bit more sensitive to accidental presses or how light can sometimes warp, off the edges of your screen. We don't have to we don't have to worry about that. I've already been using it for a bit, so you'll have to excuse. This is the pre-applied uh, plastic screen protector on the front. It already has a few little scuffs and nicks in it. The screen is a brilliant OLED. We can go into some of the screen settings. Now the smart switch is currently applied, 60 hertz or 120 hertz refresh rates, and then also some visual enhancements. Now I've, I've left these off just for the video. These were kind of fun to play around with because I've been feuding with Netflix a bit over how they portray a HDR content. And you know, when shots are super, super dark, you can toggle something like this and then kick on the additional screen brightness. And that does help kind of buffer what Netflix is sending to your phone. Model I'm using has 12 gigabytes of RAM with four gigabytes of swap space and 256 gig of storage. I feel like this is good, very good territory for a daily all-rounder smartphone. Unfortunately, even though we are talking in the mid-range, as you've noticed, we don't have a headphone jack and we don't have upgradable memory card support. So we can't pop in another memory card and just dump another 256 gigs internally. I think this is one of the transition points as we're hitting more 5G phones, trying to keep prices floating around and then also encouraging some additional accessory purchases. I kind of feel like Vivo is hoping you'll add on a pair of really nice earbuds when you pick up one of these phones. The skin is instantly familiar. We're using the Fun Touch operating system, and this is fluid, this is sleek, this is fast. The Snapdragon 870 in this phone is such a well-known, high-performance SoC. It really is a phenomenal balance of just getting you through your day, but then also tackling some of the really heavy lifting stuff too. I don't think there's a lot of value to checking out the synthetic benchmark scores, at least not so much when other manufacturers have been found sort of rigging phone performance for bigger numbers here, but then throttling performance on apps. You can kind of get an idea of what sort of peak CPU can deliver. I mean, these are scores that are about 15% lower than what you might find on an 8 Gen 1. And you've got to be very specific about where an 8 Gen 1 is going to outperform a Snapdragon 8. 70. Yeah, case in point, gaming has been excellent. Again, we know this SoC, we know this tier of performance, and uh, this is one of my favorite torture test games. It's a game called Undead Horde. So the graphics are nice. It's a, it's a pretty game, but you can definitely see it's a blockier animation style. But what's torturous about this game is it's a ton of unit management. So you've got all of these little attacking minion, you've got to control all of these little zombies, and uh, this can cook some phones. Uh, it definitely has issues on uh, Xiaomi devices and can sometimes even stutter on Samsungs. So I'm pretty confident that we're still seeing some of that BBK performance tuning where games don't necessarily always try to max out the screen refresh rate. Like I feel right now I'm getting a solid 60 frames per second. This is a game that can consistently dip and drop on more powerful phones. So you'll get a spike of performance where this game plays really, really well for about a minute, and then it crashes to an even lower tier of performance. And that's more distracting to me than I think if you just, you stayed at a steady 60 FPS. A few areas where the Neo might ask you to make a few compromises over a more expensive Vivo. The in-display fingerprint sensor is a good optical sensor, but it's not one of the fastest. Doing this little back and forth game where I like to try and see how fast I can unlock my phone, it's good, but there's always that slightly extra pulse as it scans the thumbprint and tries to get you in. Now that was a really good run. I was just going through, turning it off and turning it on and turning it off and turning it on, and it really didn't miss a beat, but it's not instantaneous. It doesn't have that same snappy feeling that the 9 Pro or the X80 Pro are going to deliver, those being significantly more expensive in-display sensors. Now, the other area where I think the Neo might ask a few compromises are on the cameras. And this is one of those trends where I really wish we could just kind of simplify. I think we'd, we'd end up getting more for our money's worth. There are technically three cameras here but you're really only gonna use two. The main sensor is a solid 64 megapixel shooter. We're, we're very familiar with that. The ultra wide is an eight megapixel image sensor, and it's pretty good if all you need to do is capture a wide field of view and you don't, you don't care about like zooming in and pixel peeping. And then we've got another one of these just 
sort of mediocre two megapixel sensors. I, I almost kind of wish like if you could just get rid of this and maybe save on some of the engineering costs and then include the slightly better ultra wide that could double as a macro shooter. I, I, I have to believe they're doing this because it is cheaper, but I wonder how much they're really saving by engineering a phone to three sensors instead of just two. Another area where the 9 Pro is offering a much more usable trio of cameras on a significantly more expensive phone. And I even tried to do sort of a little used shopping, trying to check out different international markets on an X70 Pro, because the cameras on the X70 Pro are phenomenal, but best I could do, the this Vivo was still gonna be about 40% more expensive for those better cameras over the Neo 6. If you're spending most of your time on the main sensor, it's really not worth it to shop above this price tier. But if you want all of the extra fun stuff and goodness, that's another area where you're likely gonna wanna spend more money. On these cameras, we can also see that there are some limitations put in place that are not because of the SOC. So I'm in the video mode right now, and I've got a 4K video set up at 60 frames per second. This is how I shoot everything. I shoot everything 4K 60, unless I'm climbing up to something ridiculous like 4K 120. I shot a number of samples, and I was like, oh, you know what, this, this footage is really shaky. I wonder if something's up with my unit. And then I noticed, that the stabilization icon is just off. So if we tap the stabilization icon and we set it to standard stabilization, we see that little pulse. Well, wouldn't you know it, I've been kicked down to 4K 30. The Snapdragon 870, the SOC in this phone is perfectly capable of processing through 4K 60 video with electronic software stabilization. We've seen it on numerous phones in the past. So while the main camera is very good and the ultra wide is respectable, we are still drawing some lines in the sand where we're going to limit some aspects of this performance. But a lot of what makes a Vivo so much fun to use in terms of camera tech is still on tap. We just don't quite get as much as if we were shopping at a higher tier. The phone has just been announced, so I can't quite comment as directly on things like software support on longer term updates. And then also I'm being a little sensitive to the sort of network and radio management. I've had limited success getting these international phones on T-Mobile. Obviously, very few of them are ever gonna support United States 5G. And then the different radio bands means I can't always even comment on LTE support, but I've been very very happy with the Wi-Fi, easily maxing out what my home cable connection is capable of. I pay for a 400 megabit per second download. Obviously, uh, Spectrum's given me a little bit more than that, and this thing is hooking up to Wi-Fi 6 like that ain't nothing. Increasingly, in mid-ranger Android land, radio performance is not one of the compromises we're having to ask of users anymore. It's not like that weird split dichotomy on iPhones where even a premium priced iPhone is going to have poorer radio and modem support than an iPhone Pro. We're smack dab in the sort of upper mid range here, and this thing is hanging with my Wi Fi 6 just fine. Again, also, I can comment loosely on battery life just from playing games and doing fun things with it, but your mileage will vary once you've got a SIM card in there and you're doing the 5G and all that fun stuff. I feel like the battery life has been respectable. What I'm just always gonna be impressed by, especially with these new Vivos this year, is how stinking fast they can recharge. Again, you can pay more and get a, an even faster recharge on an iQ9 Pro, 80 watt charging. You plug this thing in, you go put on your shoes, tie them, put your wallet in your back pocket, come back, and your phone has topped off almost an entire day. Not a day and a night, but an almost entire day worth of use. And of course, reiterating, that fast charger is in the box. Closing out a first look at this phone, I'm gonna stop manhandling the phone. Let's go back to my desk camera. <sighs> All right, that's probably as good a place as any we can really start wrapping this up. The Neo 6 is an impressive piece of hardware at a savagely competitive price. We've been in this holding pattern for a bit now, two years of looking at this SOC. We don't have to go shopping for older flagships to find this, this more competitive price performance. We're now just using that older flagship, which has aged phenomenally well in phones that are sub $500. The configuration that I'm using right here, the equivalent of $450 full MSRP. As a North American reviewer, the Vivo and iQ labels have, have been really exciting to watch because they represent 
a quality of conversation that we're just not quite getting here in the United States right now. Again, this is a fun hardware to software fight. If I recall phones like the Pixel 5a, I think we can be pretty sure Google's going to be offering longer term software support. But this hardware, well, this hardware is really nice. Of course, we don't always get to put those phones head to head because of differences in regional availability. And opposite the slew of phones that I've been playing with recently around this price tier, climbing up to a slightly higher price. I mean, we're, this is punching above some of the Pocos that I played with recently, some of the Redmi's. I don't think we're pricing this phone out as an extravagance. Vivo, and specifically Aiku, this label's crushing it right now. Seriously, this has just been a lot of fun. Whatever your feelings might be on a brand or a label, for me, this all comes down to price to performance. And I cannot fault the performance for this price. So I will, of course, leave some links down below where you can find more information on the Vivo IQ Neo 6. Maybe shop one of these bad boys online. Again, if you're in the United States, well, that's gonna be an import conversation. But for folks outside North America, this is gonna compete really well. As always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, subscribing to the channel. All the support lately has been tremendous. Those of you checking out the links in the descriptions, if you hit my home site, somegadgetguy.com, or those of you who have joined the list of names scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This list is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the universe. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet at some gadget guy on the Twitters and the Twitch, so much on the Facebooks and the Instagrams, and I will catch you all on the next video.